Shoot. Um, how are we doing so far? Is that all right? Okay. And what about this guy? So it is, I tell you, it's normal. I have to tell you it's normal because sample size is not big enough on its own to tell me that that sampling distribution would be normal. Um, which one can I use, the T or the Z? T, because I don't know the sigma. T scores were invented to cover ourselves for when we don't know sigma, we only have S. So what do I have to know when I go to look up in the T score chart? What do I have to do first? What's the T-score? Does it have N in it? Yeah, the degrees of freedom here would be 10. So if you look up on the degrees of freedom, 10. And how far over do I look? What's alpha going to be? 10%.10. Yeah, or So that would be in two tails. Or if you look at it in one tail, because I remember a 90% confidence interval is going to have 10% outside, so on one side it's going to have just 5%.05. How do you guys feel? Either way you look at it, if you look at it 10% in two tails or 5% in one tail, you'll still end up in that second to last column. Is that cool? This is high tech, I know. Just call it. So if we look down, I want to go to degrees of freedom of 10. And that second to last column, what T-score do I see? I like it, 1.812. Cool. And then, then what can I do on number three? T-score. I don't see it's normal, but I don't have to because N is big enough for the sampling distribution of sample means to be normal. Um, I only know S, so I have to get a T-score. First step again, degrees of freedom. So 50. Confidence interval is 95%, uh, so what's alpha? Yeah, 0 0.05. Cool. So if you look at uh, 0.05 in two tails, or 0.025 in one tail, whatever way you like to look at it. You're in the middle column. I want to stop at 50. Bam. What do I see? I like 2.009. So I don't know if any of you guys have this question, but my question would be looking at this thing, my question might be something like, well, what if I get degrees of freedom of 53? Jeff, <laughs> what if I do that? Right? And why would that be a question? Because like, there's no freaking 53 on there. So you always are more conservative. If I degrees of freedom is in between 50 and 60, I'm going to go with 50. Why would that be more conservative? What would more conservative mean as far as a confidence interval goes? To be more conservative, I wouldn't want to make it... I want to be more conservative. And remember, what's the whole point of a confidence interval? I'm trying to catch something. I'm not sure exactly where it is. So to be more conservative, I'm going to make the thing I'm using to catch it bigger. So that's why I'm going to go for a degrees of freedom that's lower, because it's going to end up with a larger T-score. Right? You want to make the T-score bigger to be more conservative. So if you have degrees of freedom of, um, oh, I don't know. Let's go for crazy here. Uh, 118, let's say, and uh, I want a confidence interval, 90% uh, confidence interval. And I know S, blah, blah, blah. What would the T-score be? So on 90% confidence, that means alpha is yeah, 0 0.10. Degrees of freedom is 118. I don't have it at 118 on there, so I'm going to go to 100. So I see a T-score of 0 0.10 and two tails. 100 is 1.66. Yes, ma'am. How do you know if you use um, the two alphas or just one, like the two tails or one? In this case, it's kind of, I really want you guys to get this. In today's lecture, we're going to see a big difference. If I have a, a confidence interval, it always makes how many tails? Two. So I can either talk about the total in both tails, so that would be in two tails, or how much in one tail. And either way I look at it, I end up in the same place on the chart. Are you with me? I mean, if it's 95% if it's confidence, there's alpha is 0.05, 
Alpha over 2 is 0.025. Those are both the same column, 0.05 in, in two tails, 0.025 in one tail. It's the same column. That kicks so much ass. Today we're going to start talking about, I want to prove something is more. So I'm only interested in that side. I'm going to have one tail. So then any alpha they give me, I'm going to shove it all in there. Cool. My word choice is always interesting. How are we doing so far? Is that decent? I mean, just the nuts and bolts of how to get this number. And I know that's, that's what people always think statistics is. It's not what statistics is. It's just part of what we have to do. Are you able to use these things correctly? Okay. Cool. So let me see. Are there any questions from the homework in Chapter 7? Let me give you one problem to try out of 7-2, and then we're going to get into chapter 8. Um, find the 98% compensable for the true percentage of Oreo packages missing. So trying to see if who does Oreo in the biscuit? They're trying to cheat us out, sliding us every now and again. So like when you go buy uh, something, if you notice, they put the, on the bottom, they make the bottom curve up. So the package looks the same size, but they're actually putting less in there. It's like, you crafty bastards. Or not, if you don't shop, I guess you wouldn't see that. So what, what, just to help you guys out, which formula are you using? I mean, you have this guy, you have this guy, which is really nice because it tells you Z goes with sigma, T goes with S. And then, of course, you have this guy. You can do a job. So, of course, which one are we using? Yeah, it's pretty easy. It's a confidence interval, so I know I want to use a formula that has a plus minus in it. It's a percentage problem. So I want to use the only one that has a P hat in it. What sucks is when you have a mean, but even then you're like, this one if I know sigma, this one if I know S. Right? So it's really not difficult to pick which formula to use, and now I just have to know how to use it right.
as you're doing this, remember how many places do you want to take the cat out to? At least three. So four is even better. Hey, what the hell? But at least three places for P-hat. All right, we'll catch up to you a little more here. P hat, so to calculate it, what would you do? 162 divided by 708. I like it. So 162 over 708. When you do that, you get. 229. 229. Mm -hmm. Be careful. Yeah. So then Q hat's got to be. Yeah, seven seven one. I like it. And the little hats just mean what? They went to party. Yeah, it's coming from a sample. Cool. Just like X with a bar on it, that's a sample mean. P and Q with a hat on it, that's a sample proportion. Cool. Uh, what's Z score going to be for ninety eight percent? Yeah. In fact, if, if who looked it up on the T chart? Anybody? What'd you get for it there? Two point three two six. Yep. So. It, 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 that's okay. By this point, it's okay. What happened to my eyes? <laughs> at, at this point, we probably know 98% kind of goes to 2.33. That's the number we were using before. The T-chart just makes it a little more precise. So either one you use is cool with me. If you kind of have it memorized, some of you guys might have it accidentally memorized. Like, oh, I don't know. Why do I know that? Uh, it's because we've done a lot of them. So if you look at the uh, T-chart, you get 2.326. Alpha would be 0 0.02. Two tails. Look all the way down. My z-scores live at the very bottom of the t-chart because as the sample gets larger, my t-scores approach my z-scores. So when it's really large, they are z-scores. Let's see, p-hat was 0.229, give or take 2.326 of these. N was 708. So this should be a very strange word to use in math. This should be satisfying in a way because everything has a place. You just put them in there. It's a plug and chug problem, right? So it's like a very basic algebra problem x plus y squared, where x is 2 and y is 3. You just plug them in and do it. Same thing here. You just got to know which thing to plug it into. Um, what do you guys get for the error when you do this piece? 0.0367. It's like 0 0.037 roughly. Yeah. Cool. So you guys got? Okay. And now I just got to add it and subtract it from the 0.229. So 0.229 minus that. Oh, um, 0.192. Yep. Yeah. 192. Uh, 2. When you add it, you get 0.26. 0.266 six roughly if you round up, cool. Are we good so far? Is that all right? And now you got to say that, use that statement. The semantics are kind of important, believe it or not. So we are 98% confident that the interval 19.2% so 26.6% 
contains the true percentage of evil packages of Oreos. Cool. Or you can just say of Oreo packages that are missing an Oreo. That's the whole purpose of a confidence interval is each interval I create now, if, if we each went out and looked at Oreo cookie packages and examined them and then did this, 98% of our intervals would capture the actual mean. 2% of our intervals would not catch it. Our sample mean would be, or sample percentage in this case, would be too far down or too far up. Because if I just choose randomly, I might accidentally choose a bunch of really good packages or a bunch of really bad packages. So there's a chance that this is so far away from the real percentage that the confidence interval won't catch it. So I have my um, real percentage is just sitting somewhere. There's my real percentage. Most confidence intervals we create, the p hat will be close enough so that when I make the confidence interval, it catches it. But a few of them won't be. And in this case, I know that 2% of them would not be. So that's what that really means. It doesn't mean that your confidence interval will catch it 98% of the time. It means that 98% of the intervals would catch it. And that's like, you just said the same thing, Jeff. No, I really didn't, but it's okay if you don't catch it because it's freaky. So does that work? That work is not too bad, right? That's decent. All right, so let's get into... Chapter 8. And we've actually been, this is really the chapter we've been building up to. Chapter 6 was the most important chapter, and now you start to see why. It's everywhere. Everything, what we learned in chapter 6 set the foundation for every damn thing we've done since, basically. But chapter 8 is really what uses that, and it's what we see in the real world all the time. So let me, let me try to step into, um, let me give you a little warning ahead of time. Um, these problems are longer than we're used to. They have five steps, and each step has parts to it. You kind of with me so far? Well, I learned it from my teacher uh, a million years ago. He had eight steps to it and all, so I tried to truncate it a little bit. And actually, the books nowadays use about five steps. Um, Every step has stuff that we've already talked about. So I'm going to do a problem that we've already done, but I'm going to try to show you how it's going to relate to what we're going to do with Chapter 8. Uh, and here's the idea. Chapter 8 is all about testing claims. That really is a huge part of what statistics does. You want to claim something, then you better have some proof to it. Right? So that's why... What we're going to do in Chapter 8, you could pull up almost any journal article that has any analysis done, and you'll see numbers that we're going to get. You're going to see the, we're going to talk about a p-value. You see p-values all over these journals everywhere, and now you're going to finally understand what the hell it is if you've ever looked at a journal before. So I want to show you some journal articles, and I'll say, look, this, we can do this work now. Holy crap. Um, so here's the idea. Let's say that um, I claim... That my stat students uh, score higher on their finals than anyone else. All right, so so far there's a claim. Bam! I claim this. So we know that. Let's say we know. Um, the average stats final grade is, um, final exam grade is, uh, let's say, let's be more realistic, 74. With a standard deviation of, yeah, about like 10.8.
So I take a, somebody, somebody wants a testament claim. So they, um, uh, Steve says you're full of crap. So Steve takes a sample of my students. And he finds um, an average grade of uh, 70, uh, Five point two. Uh, let me say, well, let me be a little more specific. A sample um, of um, uh, you can do it, Jeff. Thirty-seven of my students. Thanks. Be a little more specific. So far, so good. Are we okay? I mean, we've this kind of it sounds like a problem we've done before. Right? I mean, we're, we're going to look at um, maybe a z-score here to see how really far away my scores are from there. So that's the idea I've been trying to build you up to. If I find a z-score for this compared to that, I can see how far away my student's average grade is. And how far away it is is going to tell me something. If it's only like z-score of 0 0.2, would you say that's good evidence that my students score higher? So if the average is here, the average is 74, and I get here, is that good evidence that my students score higher? Now, of course, just the fact that this is higher than that, are some of you guys going, well, Jeff, what the hell is all this shit for? That is bigger. But they took a sample of my students. So in order for a sample to show evidence, it's got to be far enough away. It can't just be bigger. It's got to be bigger enough. It's got to be out here. And that's what the whole idea of that unusual thing was building us up towards. If it's out there, then it's evidence that something's different. If it's in here, then it's consistent with that. I expect samples to be a little off from the mean. It's not going to be the perfect mean, but they should be close. But if I get far enough away, I'm going to use that over this phrase, far enough away. I get far enough away from whatever the accepted average is, or whatever the thing is, whatever the, the, um, the normal average in this case is, if I get far enough away from that, then that's evidence that, yes, my students are different, or I grade easier, or whatever. You guys kind of with me so far? Is it? A lot of what we've been doing has been building up towards this. We've been talking about evidence, unusual, usual, all this kind of stuff. So if it's unusual, it's evidence that something weird is going on. I don't know what that something weird is, but by itself it just says, look at this a little closer. Something weird is going on. Um, so somebody help me out. What, what we do in this case then is we say, we assume that my average is actually 74. We say, let's assume that you're right. And I want to show you, and we do this all the time in, in English in real life. We say, assuming you're right, how the hell did that just happen? Right? Like somebody says, I never get into an accident. Yeah. <clears throat> Oops. Assuming you're right, what the hell just happened? You're full of crap, right? That's how I disproved your claim. Bam. Um, but that was a little bit easier to disprove. How do I set up a z-score? What do I actually have to do first before I want to get a z-score? So what do we have here? We have the accepted mean is 74. I'm not going to really use that language a lot, but it's the idea. It's the accepted mean. It's... it's it's uh, where it's been, where it's thought to be, and we're always trying to disprove that. I'm trying to show that my average is different from this accepted mean, from this historical average. Mine is different. What's x bar? Beautiful. That's from my, the sample of my students. What symbol do I use for 10.89? I love it. This came from all stats final exam grades. So that must be sigma. Cool. There we go. So how do I get the z score now? What do I do? What do I have to do first before I want to calculate the z score? Just going back to chapter seven. Actually, check yes. The end of chapter 6. Good old central limit theorem. 
What's N? 37. So it has to change. Standard deviation, I love it. I took a sample, I'm talking about the sample means. I better change my standard deviation. I can't use that one anymore. What's sigma x bar gonna be? 10.89 divided by square root of 37. Cool. Like 1.8. 1.79. 1.79. Oh, cool. I like so when that happens, just to cover your ass, yeah, I'm normally pretty good. I, I can tell it's going to come out to be that. But just, you know, just to humor your stats professors, put it zero. You're like, I know, Jeff. So now if I want to make a z-score, how would I set that formula up? The z-score for my students. What minus what? X, in this case, it's actually going to be yeah, my sample data. So x bar, but it's still my sample data. Minus the mean divided by the correct standard deviation. Considering I just made this up out of nowhere. I didn't know how this was going to come out, but I was trying to make it not be good enough. And I think I managed that. Six seven. Yeah. yeah. Six seven. Yeah. So would you say just looking at that, I haven't given you any um, any basis of comparison yet, and that's going to be a part of this. Is it's up to the problem, it's up to the people I'm trying to prove something to to set the benchmark. Let me try to say this again. Would you guys say that that's good enough evidence or not that my students' grades are so far away from this that it shows that something's different? Is that showing that evidence? No, it's not very far away at all. It's two-thirds of a step away. Ooh, Jeff. Where'd it go? Are you guys with me on that? What is, what, where would it be good enough? Yeah, okay, so so far, right now, we know two. If it was more than two, or about two or more, then that's, that's when we say, okay, that's unusual. And now we're going to be a little more real to life with this situation. That's going to change based on who I'm trying to prove something to. For example, if you're trying to prove to the fire insurance company, um, a new fire station just opened closer, and you want to prove that fire trucks can get to your neighborhood quicker, they're going to set the level of proof, and it's probably not going to be two. It's probably going to be... Uh, 2.757 or 2.576 are the, the you know the, you're going to see all these same z scores coming up that we should be used to from confidence intervals. You guys kind of with me? So depending on the situation, it's going to change. So this not good enough evidence to support my claim, right? It's not enough evidence to support my claim. So that's all stuff we've done before. Somebody help me out too. Um, so here's the, the mean is here, 74. Here's my 75.2. Can somebody tell me what that area is right there? Maybe you have to look something up. You're staring at me. What did we just find out about 75.2, which will help us there? Yeah, the z-score is 0.67. So what area is in that tail? Point 0.7.6. So 1 minus that, right? Yeah. Do it up? Yeah. So it would be point 0.2, what did you say, 7, 4, 8, 6? One four. Alright. Sorry. So you guys got two five one four? Okay. You guys kinda of with me here? That that's what's called the P value. Twenty five percent, is that unusual? If something's got a twenty five percent chance of happening, is that unusual? No. No. 
I would not want to open up one of four envelopes, and one of them has uh, ricin in it, right? That's been in the news. It was not the Elvis impersonator. Right? Does anybody have any clue what I'm talking about? Yes. Yes, a few of you do. The rest of you uh, get a newspaper. <laughs> um, that is definitely not unusual. Remember, 5% would be unusual, officially. Now it's gonna, that definition is going to change a bit. But if something's got a 25% chance of happening, that's a decently high percentage chance of happening. It's going to happen once every four times. That's, that's pretty high. Um, that's what we call the p-value, the amount that's in that tail that my score makes. So, let me try to set up a problem we're actually going to see in chapter 8. This is all stuff, this is basically one step away from chapter 8. We just have to formalize a few things. So let me look at this, oh, of course I just erased the problem. Let me look at that problem again. What was the claim that I was making? Good. So the claim I was making was that my mean is was bigger than 74. That was a claim I was making. You with me? So if that's my claim, what am I kind of fighting against? What would the opposite of that be? What's the opposite of greater than 74? Don't be careful. Don't just say less than. Or equal to. I like it. So if I cannot show that, and we didn't, did we? We didn't find evidence to support my claim. It, it wasn't good enough evidence. It wasn't far enough away. If I can't prove this, then that must mean that it looks like this is true. It's at most 74. If you can't prove that it's greater, so then it must be at most 74. You can't prove it's greater. And again, you've got to release yourself from, well, Jeff, that number is bigger than 74. I don't care. It's just a sample. It is just a sample. I could have just happened to pick a bunch of higher scoring finals. The sample's got to show good evidence, and this is not good enough. So here's the, um, the formalization of this, and this would be step one on a hypothesis test. Step one on a hypothesis test would be, what's the claim? And then what are my two hypotheses? You always have these two hypotheses. You've got the null hypothesis, and you've got the alternate hypothesis. And in an old book I used to use, it was the ho and the ha, but this book has the ho and the hi. I don't know if you guys realize that little subscript zero. You've seen that before, believe it or not. You've seen like... Um, Remember this formula? You guys remember that formula? Anybody? Just pretend like you do. Yes. Right. Okay. That's the slope of the line. Mm -hmm. right. What did that little 2 mean and the little 1? What did they actually mean? They actually, by themselves, don't mean a damn thing, right? Y2 is the second Y coordinate. Y1 was the first Y coordinate, so forth. So this 0 doesn't really mean, it just means the null hypothesis. Null is another word for zero. Right? This is what's called a null hypothesis. By the way, just to make you feel a little better, if you're worried about your notes on this, I've got a little handout that's got like all this stuff on it. The null is the one that always has the equal sign in it. Which one of these could I actually prove? That's a weird question. But you can't Using a sample, can I prove that something equals something? Just using a sample. Can I prove that the average gas price is exactly $3.72 if I go out and take a sample? Hell no. But I can show that it's greater than that or less than that. If somebody says the average gas price is two bucks, so you're, look, 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 look. You're, you get out. Right? I, I've shown evidence that it's much bigger than that. You with me? So I can show evidence that it's bigger than, but I cannot show evidence that it's equal to. So H1 is the one that I can prove. HO is the one I can't. So HO always has an equal sign. HO always has an equal sign. Right? It's either like less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, or it's equal to. So in this case, it would be that guy, and this would be the other guy. Now in this case, the claim happens to be H1. Right, the alternate hypothesis.
But it doesn't always have to be that way. So again, this is just setting up kind of the two opposing viewpoints. Here's what I feel is true, and here's what the opposite, the standard establishment would believe to be true. Um, and the only thing we're really missing now is, is uh, the idea of what is good enough evidence. And this is actually going to be given to me. They're going to tell me we will be told alpha. And what does alpha mean again? The tail. The tail. What about the tail? Or tails? Outside is where the tails are. I like it. But what about the tails themselves? Alpha is the amount of Both. area or probability in those, right? So alpha is the amount of area, amount of area, is uh, in one or two tails. Depends on what your claim is. Here, what do you think this would lead to? How many tail tests would this be? How many tails would this have? What side am I interested in ending up? So if they say it's 74 and I think it's more, where do I want to end up? Where do I want my sample to end up if I think it's more? I want to end up there. So how many tails will I have? One. So now you see why the T-chart is set up the way it is. One tail, two tail. You have a one tail test or a two tail test. Cool, I can look exactly where I need to go. Check. So if I told alpha, and I know the number of tails, I can then look up the Z or T. That would be my benchmark. Right? So here, I knew that 0.67 is definitely not good enough. I don't even have to give you a freaking benchmark. But if I said my benchmark was 2.33 or 1.96, then you can kind of officially compare it and say we didn't make it. We didn't make it far enough away. All right, so let me give you this handout. And we're going to try to do the problem together on this handout. And then i got a problem with the back. I'm going to try and see if you can do it on your own. Make sure you have a front and back. semester, but I actually looked up the numbers. This is, this is sort of semi-official. I did not go and talk to 74 people about their credit cards, so I'm sorry. That part I made up. The first part is actually based on a true story. Okay, so let's take a look at this thing. Um, so I've got all the five steps. I've really only talked about one step up on the board because that's the one step that's really kind of brand new. Not uh, freeze jump. Okay. Um, so the average credit card debt was this. We think the debt has increased. Uh, from a sample of 74 people with cards, we find a, stand, a mean debt of that. Test the claim using this. So they're going to have to give me alpha. So first off, it, it, can you write in math what the claim actually is? What is the claim? And I did not use that language, of course, but that doesn't matter. Okay. 
and let my home audience see what the hell we're talking about. What would the claim be in math ish? Math speak? The mean is greater than 4,600. I like it. So we think the mean, the mean debt has increased from what it was, is greater than 4,672. So I will never see, I will never ever see sample information there. Well, I have to be able to make my claim before I even take my sample, but we're in the situation where they give me everything. But in the real world, we go, I think this, and then we go take a sample. You will never see sample information here. Right? Our claim is the mean debt has gone, has increased from what it was. Which one will that be then? The whole or the high? Yeah, because it does not have what? It doesn't have an equal sum. The null must have the equal sum. So that will be the high. So what's the whole then? I love it. Just the opposite. So this one happens to be my claim. My claim could be either one, because if my claim was, I think it stayed the same, my claim would be mu equals that, and that would have been HO. My claim could be either one. Is this going to be a one or a two-tailed test? So what's my claim again? What's the H1, actually, y'all? You can look at the H1. That's the one I can prove. And I want to show it's greater than this. So a two-tail test, we haven't even seen a two-tail test. A two-tail test would have to say something like, we think it's changed. We think it's different. We think it's no longer the same. Because how do you show something's not the same anymore? You show that it's bigger or smaller. That would be a two-tail test. Because then you, you don't care. Whichever way you go, you just want to get far enough away from it in either direction. Here, I want to go specifically show that it's increased. So this must be a one-tail test. I only want to end up up here somewhere. So this must be a one-tail test. So all the alpha they gave me is going to fit right in there. And that's, again, why the T-chart is set up for one and two-tail. Now, I didn't talk about B yet because B is pretty straightforward. <coughs> Step two, can we use z-scores, t-scores, or nothing? And this is where you have to be careful about which piece, which really tells me. Now, step number one, is it normal? Would we have a normally distributed set of sample means from this problem? Why? Because the samples. Than yeah, exactly. I got 74 people. So n is 74 is bigger than 30. Check. So I can use one of these. It's not going to be nothing. I can actually do something. So how do I tell which one I'm going to use? What do I look at? How do I tell if I'm going to use z or t? What do I look at? Standard deviation. Which standard deviation do I have? T scores were invented for if I don't know the population standard deviation. What situation am I in then? The average priority debt for all Americans is this with the standard deviation of that. So my standard deviation came from the population. So sigma is known, I can use what? Use z scores, I love it. So think about this real quick. I really want you, I mean, the z score kind of sets up how far away I've got to get, my sample's got to get. So I, often, I like to think of it like uh, I'm a football coach and I'm trying to get somebody else on my team and I need somebody fast because everybody else i got on my team are slow as hell. So I need some little old rocket Ishmael on my team, somebody just to run down the sideline and just burn everybody away. So I, I hold these tryouts and I have a benchmark. I say, you've got to run the, the 400 less than whatever. I, yeah, I don't do these things. I have no idea what a good time is. Um, so I set a benchmark, and I see who's going to show me evidence that they should be on my team. So really, that's what the z-score does. Um, using the alpha, it's going to show, it's going to set up a benchmark, and my stand, my sample has to get over here to show evidence or not. So if I if I did not know the standard deviation of the population, there's a part of it that I don't know that I'm not sure about. So what should my benchmark do in response? It should get harder to pass. 
That's why I would use it. Every T score is always going to be bigger than the Z score would have been. So it makes my test harder to pass, which only makes sense because there's something about it that I'm not sure about. Here, we know it. So I can use Z score. Don't have to make it bigger. Um, so part C is exactly what I was just talking about. It's called the rejection region. And the reason it's called that is if I get in here, what can I say about this? If I get so far up above 74, what can I say about the person that believes this? That they are wrong. I can reject their statement, right? And that's why this is called the rejection region. That's almost too silly. It's funny math people didn't call it something more complicated, but we said, what the hell? So where will it be, first off? I want to know, where will that benchmark be? And again, I can just go up here and say, oh yeah, I'm interested in up here. I want to show it's greater. So I know it's going to be up here. What's alpha? Yeah, 0.05 alpha. So I know that's got to be 0.05. One tail, z-scores. Take a second to figure out what that benchmark is going to be. Remember, the t-chart is a really good place to go for this. 0.05, one tail test. Look all the way at the bottom for a z-score. What do you guys get? 1.645. So cool, so here, since I've got this up and running, if I look at 0.05 and one tail, 0.05, look all the way at the bottom, there's my z-score, right? The z-scores are at the bottom of that chart. It just kicks ass the way they set this up for hypothesis tests. Okay. You all right? Yay, John. Good. Okay. So, what I mean by put it into words also is this. Here's the words we would use. Uh, if we, if um, the z-score we get from our sample, and again, that's exactly what I was saying here. If the z-score we get from our sample is in here, we can say, this one's wrong, this one looks to be right. If we don't get in there, we say, I can't say you're wrong, I can't say this one's right. That's the basic idea. It's almost too simple of an idea for all the freaking steps there are. Right. So how do I actually say this? And the symbol I use just to just to be um, that way is I use Z star. That's the because there's like a Z score here. So I want to call it something that's Z star. That's the Z score I get from my sample. The book will not say that. This is just a weird thing that I do. So if Z star is more than 1.645. We can reject. You can love this. We can reject the hoe. There you go. Support. you like this even better. Support the high. So just deal with it. The way that I say that. But you can reject the null hypothesis. And support the alternate hypothesis. If you'd rather say that. We're doing okay so far? I mean, don't forget. It's so easy to get so caught up in all the freaking steps and making sure you get everything and forget the main idea is, is simple. If I'm so far away from this, my average can't be that. I'm so far away from it. How could my average actually be that? It's, a, it's so unlikely that my sample would have come from something with that mean because its mean is so up there. I mean, that, so what's more likely? My mean is actually bigger. That's the basic idea. So these two actually are the heart of hypothesis test. How far away do I have to get? How far away did I get? Right. C sets up the benchmark. How far away do I have to get? C set, and then D says, okay, how far away did I get? So what do I know from my sample information? Somebody help me out. What, what's the N from my sample? 74. What's the X bar? Um, 4, Good, 4897, And the standard deviation was 954. And before I make a z-score, what do I have to do? Yeah, see it right there. You have to find a new standard deviation, right? 
So sigma x bar would be the old one divided by the square root of n. And that, of course, is one something. 110.900. 0, 0. 110 yeah. That's neat. That seems. That yeah, seems about right. Is that what you guys got? Yeah. 9002474. Zero, zero, four, four. Sweet. I like it. So 110.9. Cool. <clears throat> this part should feel very familiar. We're just doing a z score in part D. So the z-score would be my data, it's always my data first, minus the mean, and, and really the, what's behind the hypothesis test is we're saying, okay, assuming that it is 4,672. So we're going to say the mean is 4,672, how did I just do this? That's really what we want to end up saying. Okay, assuming you're right, what the hell's that? That's the best attempt at New York Um so let's see, 4,672. So I want to see how far apart are those two, how far is my sample from this relative to the data. So I've got to divide it by the standard deviation. So how many standard deviations is my sample away? Is it far enough away? So what do you guys get? 2.03. That's a big ass too. 2.03. Did we make it? Is it far enough away? Look back at step C. We had to get 1.645, and here's another reason why I call it Z star. And we got here. We got a 2.03. So part C says acceptable evidence that your sample is unusual compared to what the mean should be is a z-score of more than 1.645. We got a z-score of 2.03, it's more than two steps away, so either way you look at it, that's unusual, that's evidence that there's something weird about this sample. And in this case, we're just trying to show that um, this year has increased from that year, and that's what we just showed. But right here, let me take a second. Can somebody help me out? What would the p-value be? Can somebody remember how to get that? A 2 is troubling me. So what do you guys get for that? What what does that mean, p value? That's the area that's where? Well, the area that you just drew, Jeff. Okay. So the area that's above our z score. So what do you guys get for that? What area is in that tail above 2.03? Zero two one two. And what that really means is, and this is key, I really want you guys to understand, if the average this year was actually still uh, 4,672, there's only a 2% chance that we could take a sample and get what we got. That's what that really means. There's only a 2% chance that we could take a sample. If it really was this, there's a 2% chance we would have gotten this. So what's more likely, that we just happen to pick a bunch of people that owe a lot of money? or that the actual average has increased. Second option is more likely. It's only a 2% chance that it actually is this. So it's much more likely that it's not that. I like that. So two ways you can look at it. We, we reached our benchmark. Right? We exceeded our benchmark, 1.645. We beat the hell out of that. But also, this is small enough. What, what number do you think I really should compare this to? Just like we compare the 2.03 to the 1.645, I can compare the p-value to the alpha. Right? You guys are loving this. So if alpha, alpha here was 0.05, and that's bigger than 0.02, 1, 2. 
So that's another way of saying, of reaching the same conclusion that yes, we can reject the null hypothesis. Woo! And again, it's the first damn time we're running through one of these, so do not freak out if you're not quite with it yet. I just hope at this point that some of this looks familiar. Some of the ways I'm saying it don't sound familiar. Some of the terminology obviously is not familiar. Um, so here we can say reject the hoe. If I can reject the null, what can I say about the alternate? See, yeah, we support it. Support the hot. So then finally, what is your conclusion? And just like with the confidence intervals, there is an associated little paragraph you have to write here. So here we go. We have found, because we got into the rejection region, so we've succeeded. We have found sufficient evidence. And here you can either say to reject the hoe, this claim, this, or support the high, and you always choose, because that's both true. Those are both true. We did both things, of course. We said that guy's wrong, so that guy must be right. It looks different. But we always pick the one that's our claim. The claim happens to be the high. So I say we have found sufficient evidence to support the claim that the mean debt in America has increased. Pop. Right, and you can get that language straight from the from the uh, paragraph. Right. If I start saying pop pop, somebody should hit me. Maybe I watch community, you know? I've seen it. Yeah, like I watch it every day, Jeff, when I come to school. <laughs> Actually like Alright, so let's do this. The last little bit of time, see how far we can I'm going to kind of let you guys work a little bit, and I'm going to do step one. Work a little bit, I'm going to do step two. And then we'll just pick up next time, however far we make it. So try to get one A set up.